I'm loading the lower so I can coil the upper. Where I see some people kind of do this, right? Where the, the left glute or the right glute gets too close to the left knee. So I'm trying to get them to feel like they're, and we got 50 pound sandbags, right? And you're standing there those, and hand it to you like yep, this, right? Going. Exactly. But I would yep. have someone put their grip right in the hip joint. And I'm like, look it, I want that hip joint to go back. Yeah. If you right. straighten that leg, there's just no load in no the muscle. Load. No load. Right, so flex the leg. And all of a sudden, now the muscle's engaged, right? Then I can explode. Then I'm going to use that shoulder late and drive it right through the golf ball, right? Absolutely. So here's a common, common problem that I see. I see amateurs all the time talking about turning and stuff on YouTube. Turn your hip as much as you can. Well, mm. I can turn my hips forever and have no power, right? right? And I use boxing as an analogy all the time. So if I got a heavy bag and I'm going to hit a heavy bag, right, and I turn my hips like this, I'd like to fight that guy. I actually don't want to fight <laughs> yeah. that guy, but my point is there's no power there. So I'd rather have more load and less turn than more turn and less load, right? So what am I, when I say load, what am I talking about? I'm talking about physically loading the quad and the glute. So if I'm a boxer and there's a heavy bag right here, right? I'm gonna go back. And I, I love when you talked about the sequencing of that. So. You know, do I want to be into the heel when my arms are halfway back? Heck no, right? I almost cussed there. So <laughs> <laughs> That's how much we don't want you to do that, by the way. Yeah. So anyway, I want to be kind of here so that I have room to move. So as I, as I load, right? And when I say load, I'm feeling if I'm posted on that left hips right there. And then it's almost like a separation, like I'm pulling that right glute away from the left knee. Where I see some people kind of do this, right? Where the the left glute or the right glute gets too close to the left knee. So I'm trying to get them to feel like they're kind of separate. I used to love right? how you always told me that trail hip, that pocket should just work perpendicular. Back, back right? From your ball, from the target line, right? Yeah. So it just, you know, wasn't spinning. Right. Wasn't bumping the wall here. Right. It was perpendicular you, right back. You know what I, well, you probably remember this Adam, but I yeah. would tell, have someone put their grip right in the hip joint. And I'm like, look it, I want that hip joint to go back. Yeah. Right. So I don't want it to go this way. And I don't want the grip to go that way. I want it to go back. Do that again. Kev, come over here. I want you to get a visual right. of this right so, here. So I right do here. that, right? And do, if the club staying in front of me, right, my lower body is going back. Well, I feel a tremendous amount of load in my glute and in my quad, right? Why that's so important is if I'm loaded, what we talk about getting to the left side, right? I don't have to. I like to always say weight doesn't, or weight wants to go where it hasn't been, right? So if I feel pressure right here, I don't have to tell myself to go here. I want to go there because it's loaded up. Whereas if I'm like this, right, I don't have to tell myself to go backward. It wants to go backward, right? So I'm really trying to load that energy up. And like I said, I would rather have someone, then this has to do with flexibility. Like the end range for most players is not going to be like Tiger Woods, right? Their end range might be right here. I'd rather have someone fully loaded with their arms here than to go back further and compromise Absolutely. those positions where they're not powerful. So someone's, a lot of people would have a lot more power from here than if they got the club back further the wrong way, right? One thing we could take out of this right now, okay? We, to, we both agree that that inch hip bump, okay? An inch and an inch, really. We have an inch hip bump. We have the inch with the sternum. So they both bump go slide. just like that, right? That puts us in a position to where we can turn around the fixed points that we created, our spine angle and that lead leg. What's great is this trail hip now is moving more this is how Todd was doing it right here. Perpendicular from the target line. I love that. I watched one of your videos when you, when you, when you talked about that in the really? dome. I saw you talking about yeah, that yeah. right here. So when I do that, this gets to its deepest point. My torso turned completely. I'm trying to sync those up and make sure that as this reaches its deepest point. Now, a way that I phrase that is this way. I see a lot of players, and this is one of the common things that I see standing on this range all the time. I see players turn from here and here, and here. Yeah. And that's where the weight just gets back here very early. It opens up the door for everything to get caught behind you right away. It throws the entire sequence of the swing. Well, the other thing that happens, go ahead and do that. There's, if you straighten that leg, there is no load in the no muscle. Load. No load. Right, so flex the leg, and all of a sudden now the muscle's engaged, right? And so, yep. you know, sometimes I phrase it as load coil. It helps people understand, okay, lower, upper. The load Meaning, is, yep, 100%. Yep, so I'm, loading the, the, I'm loading the lower 
so I can coil the upper. I right? love our viewers hearing this because these are the things I've quoted you on so many times. Really? And now they're wondering, now they're going, I've heard poor, that was poor Zach. No, it wasn't, you guys. That was Todd Sohn's. <laughs> it was just, funny. I just listened. Yeah, okay, so yeah. the big thing about it is I always define it. The lower body is the load, the upper body is the coil. Yeah. And that's exactly how it works. And, you know, coil. one thing that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a comparison on. There was about a year and a half ago, two years ago, where Patrick Mahomes had a lull in his season. Remember that time, Kevin? You're a big football fan. Where he had a, a series of games where he wasn't doing great. And this is, this is what I heard. I, I, I don't know the facts behind it, but this is what I heard. It sounded good. Okay, it talked about how his three-step drop. Okay, and they talked about how his response time to the linebackers coming off the edge wasn't as fast, and he wasn't releasing his passes as quickly as he typically was. And what his quarterback coach said was when he was going into his three-step drop, he was keeping his trail leg very straight. When people say straighten out the right leg, and I've had the questions come at me because that's what my coach told me. Yeah. Listen, I'm just simply going to say, without bashing anybody here, <laughs> there's no sport, pitching, running block, starting off, where that trail leg is not bent. That knee has to be flexed. When you straighten up, he couldn't push off to create the speed he needed There's to to no get away from those big line the glute, right? Couldn't fire to be able to rotationally get that ball out of his hands and get some pop to those passes. So, the way I phrase it, I turn more from the pocket and the shoulder. There's a personal feeling, even though we're talking about the torso, this defines the right side of my torso here. And I've always felt, after Todd told me how to swing correctly, that this is my, the center of my merry-go-round, my spine. This was the right side. This was the left side. I felt myself turn from here and here, not from here. The knee stayed very still for me. Of course, it moved back a little bit with my body's turn in actuality. But for me, it stayed solid, and I turned from my torso. And that was the look right there. And I feel very explosive from there. And I'm telling you right now, you want to find out if that's correct for you or not? Do this drill. Get back to that Hideki Matsuyama drill where you straighten this out like this and then try to create some power. No chance. Yeah. Just throw my arms at it. Or, 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 ready? Here's the turn from the torso. Here's the load and coil. Here's the right knee staying flexed. Right. Okay. A groove low on the club face, but you know what? The same as my other yeah, shots and still out to the distance. You yeah. Know, you know what? Here's a phrase. I, well, you, you've heard me say this, but weight wants to go where it hasn't been, right? So it, it's pressure. I understand it's pressure, but, you know, if I'm like this and I feel the pressure, my weight, pressure, whatever you want to call it, is over on my front leg, it doesn't want to go forward. It actually wants to go back. Just like, you know, when I'm like this, I don't have to tell myself to go over there. I want to do it, right? I want to launch off of it, yep. right? So yep. it's like so often, you know, I think you said this a lot where I don't have to try to get left. If you're not getting left, you know, this is a phrase I always like in teaching, ask why to, you can ask why no more. So often I see people trying to fix, you know, effects. I'm coming over the top and they're trying to fix, I'm coming over the top. And I'm like, well, the solution isn't in the what. What you're doing is coming over the top. We have to figure out why you're coming over the top. Absolutely. And that's where the solution is always in the why. It's never in the what in any problem, right? So if I'm loaded properly, you know, if you find that, man, I keep hitting off my back leg, ask yourself why. What are the things that are causing you to hit off your back leg? There's a why for it. And until you fix those, you're never going to fix the what, mm, right? Absolutely. That yeah, and, you know, and that's what's great is, you know, we, we talked about how Todd didn't just help me with my understanding of technique it was understanding how to be a golfer how to be a player how to be an athlete and you know he really gave me a lot of you know a lot of sayings like that that helped me understand how i needed to be to really improve and get better and be a student of the game yeah um and, and really why you've become a really good teacher <laughs> i appreciate the that the other thing i want to talk about is you know people say shoulder turn right and i've said that forever as a young teacher i used to say it all the time and i'm trying to you know stop that habit because it's not it's shoulders. Yeah, help our viewer understand this this is a big one so shoulders don't turn shoulders they shrug and they can move across their body and a lot of amateurs have fake shoulder turns here's what i mean by that so if i stand here and don't move my torso at all i can move my shoulder back probably six inches which is really bad for you by the way because that puts a lot of pressure on your it's called your supraspinatus which is one of the major muscles in your rotator cuff but anytime you take your the ball out of its socket, you're stressing the rotator. So, so if I go like this, it looks like I've turned my shoulder, start to move my shoulder behind the ball. I haven't turned at all. So if I put my shoulder back in the socket, it exposes that I didn't turn. Now, if I keep my shoulder in its socket mm -hmm. and I start to turn my torso, it looks like this. 
And I loved Adam when you said the sensation, I think it's much better to think about the right shoulder blade getting kind of against the back because that makes you turn your torso. When Todd would make me turn my torso, the torso was turning. The visual that I had when I would look down was that my shoulder, lead shoulder, would get under and past my chin. So dad would naturally come up to me before a tournament saying, hey, complete your turn, shoulder under your chin. Yep. The thought wasn't I was just trying to move the shoulder, the shoulder blade there. Yeah, I was simply, when I played my best, my right shoulder blade felt like it tucked back into back my into spine. You. It yeah. felt, but that was a product of Todd helping me understand that this was turning. Right. Okay. You know what sometimes I do with people, I'd say, just imagine that we're, you know, we're buddies and we're gonna build a sand wall before a flood and we got 50 pound sandbags, right? And you're standing there and I'm gonna hand it to you, right? I'm not gonna go like this. Right. I'm gonna use the big muscles and hand it to you like yep, this, and right? I'm going... Exactly, right? There you go. Yeah. That's your back. So that's a big thing, understanding that we're not just looking at the position of the shoulder in relation to the golf ball, right? We're looking at the torso, mm -hmm. and, and I think the better way to think about it is, you know, trying to get that right shoulder blade almost to get against the spine at the top. Think about how much you lose connection at the top of the swing when the shoulder blade just goes across like this. You know, you see that, you see that arm just wrap right across the chest. Yeah. The golfer thinks they've turned, but if I drew a line perpendicular from where their sternum is, it's pointed right there. And, the and their arms and hands are back here. Yep. And that's already behind you and trailing and forcing yep. you to play catch up through the golf. You told me something the other day on the phone that I want you to tell the viewers. I don't know. What about the uppercut? Oh, yeah, yeah. So people like that a lot. I so, love this. Yeah, so, so many amateurs come there. I'm over the top, I'm over the top. And, but let's say now we've gone through some really good hard work and we're loaded properly and our arms are in front of us and we're in a position where we could deliver the club properly. But I've got a pattern of how I've always hit, gone at that golf ball Basically, what over the top is, is your right shoulder is too active, too early in relation to the golf ball, so it's always moving toward the golf ball. That's over the top. Well, it, I like boxing as an analogy for golf, so if, if I want to throw a right jab or right cross, I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to go this way or that way, right? If I'm going to throw an uppercut, I'm actually going to keep the trail shoulder back, right? and I'm gonna to start to throw energy and I'm gonna use that trail shoulder late. So I always say the downswing or transition is like a sideways uppercut. So if the bag's over here and I'm loaded properly, I'm gonna throw a sideways uppercut. My shoulder is gonna trail, it's gonna stay back. While my arm, I'm transferring energy to that left hip, right, naturally, without thinking. My arm's gonna go under and then I can explode. Then I'm gonna use that shoulder late and drive it right through the golf ball, right? Absolutely. So sideways uppercut versus right jab or right cross. Absolutely, and you know, I, I think that that's incredibly important. I think another thing that's incredibly important too, that I've had so much success with people who lead with their chest. You know, my hips and hands fire from the top of my swing. I feel like I always call it hip and grip. I really feel my hips and my hands fire. I feel like my chest follows my hands through impact. I've yeah. always been a believer of that. One thing that I have a lot of my players do, I have them, start, I have them hit two shots for me really. I have one where I say, okay, listen, let's, 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 let me show you something real quick. Why don't you hit a ball with your chest facing the target real quick? All right, that's all you got? Okay. Well, why don't you do one where your chest is completely away from the target? And you do that. I haven't hit balls like that often. And this is a big point to the golf swing that goes, un you know, not addressed enough in my opinion, hand speed. Hand speed is incredibly important. And what Todd always helped me with is an understanding that in short game, in the swing, you can equate that to a horse race. The body and the hands and the golf club. The body's the inside horse traveling around a track. And my dad actually pointed out something great. After Todd explained the horse race to me, what I thought was so cool, my dad took Ben Hogan's swing. The initiator of hips first, everything follows. Not necessarily the greatest piece of advice for the average golfer out there who's and disconnected already. As far as I'm concerned, any golfer. Any golfer, I'm, I'm glad to hear Todd say that again, okay, yes. Because here's the point Dad brought to me after Todd explained this to me, and I just was grasping it as a young golfer. I go, wow, that makes nothing but sense. I need a photo finish at the bottom. One has a lot greater distance to travel than the other. What goes untalked about is the hands are traveling about 28 miles per hour for a, an average tour player without body speed alone. So you think about that and you go, okay, then Dad did this and it, just, it clicked big. He drew a black dot on Hogan's belt. Showed me at the top of Hogan's swing where the, back, where the black dot was and where the hands were. Showed him right here with the hands down here. Showed him right here with the hands out here. My dad goes, Adam, that belt buckle moved six inches. And dude, 
those hands just move six feet. That's right. So understanding that leaving it up there, although I get what's being talked about, don't manhandle it, leaving it up there and just turning, I'm sorry, if that's not getting you results like so many come to me and tell me it doesn't, there's a reason why. Hand speed is very important. And I think it's, it goes not talked about enough. I want you all to watch my hands relative to my body in the swing. Yes, the hips are clearing. Yes, I'm ripping through it, but watch the hands. And what always helped me was even though there's constant rotation without any speed bumps, I am zipping these babies by me. And I've had a lot of success with players of understanding hitting shots like this for a while and just disassociating their arms and their chest from each other. Because it's really, yeah, I'll let you speak on that for well, a minute I think there as well. It's really interesting. You know, what I'll do is I'll take, take any player on tour and put a box around their hips and a circle around their head, take them to the top and stop, and then you take them halfway down, okay? The hips will have moved, and we always say this, so that the hip joint basically is aligned, right, over the heel. Now, at that point, it creates a post and starts to rotate. So mm -hmm. it doesn't keep going, right? Mm -hmm. It just it basically lines up. You know, you always want your weight bearing joints in alignment. So if, if my hip joint is not over my heel, I have to have enough lateral to get it there. Now, what's interesting is by the time, we'll say the hips have traveled half a hip or six inches, five inches, whatever, by the time the hips have made this move, right, the hands have literally gone from here to here. So I show people all the time, I'm like, look at if you tell me your downswing starts in the lower body, I'll say it does. But, you know, as the lower body is doing this, the hands have to accelerate, they have to go fast. And most amateurs have, they have what I call slow hands. Yes. In other words, they're rotating, un unloading their body, upper body, but their hands haven't moved. That's Absolutely. what over the top is. So if I can get my hands down here, kind of like in this position where my hands are as low as my belt line, at the time where I've unweighted my right side, now I can unload and turn the corner. But the minute you turn with what I call slow hands, and here's a cool drill at home. Just take a, find an eight pound medicine ball or six pound medicine ball and throw it into the ground as hard as you possibly can behind your yes. feet. Like go, it's take a good this. full rotation, torso turn and throw it into the ground as hard as you can because you're getting the hands down. And so a lot of times the people are like this or like this, either way, they're in trouble. Their hands are slow. Their lower body's faster than their hands. Guys, try skipping a rock keeping your arm on the side of your body. I call it widen on the side. And let's see how well you do. <laughs> or, right. okay, the whole point being, the whole point being, that elbow was in front of my right side. I always, as you told me, have the right elbow beating my right pocket to the golf ball. I always have my young players with the alignment rod in here and helping them stay in front of them like this, yep. helping the arms get in front of them. Now what's great about that is, you watch me skipping a rock. If I don't get this in front, there's no way I can crack that whip right there, okay? If I leave it wide on the side, kerplunk. And that's the problem that I see so many have. So many are swinging their arms and their hands at the same speed as their torsos unwinding. And that unfortunately is where everything gets behind them and really steep and then dumped into the ground on the way down rather than here, boom. There's that throwing that medicine ball right down to the ground. But the most important thing for me is the hips and hands are firing. You look at my chest, my chest is facing the ball. Everything else is opened up in this way chest follows through impact. And the next big thing I had was the understanding that golf is always played easier underneath you than around you. And I used to love Todd showing this to everybody because it was so cool. You could literally see it with the way you throw the ball. This is, this is really cool. This is you know, true, the short game true of, uh, of the full swing. You know, so he'd get you in the right setup, but then he'd also get you in the wrong one, right? And here's the point that I have to release it just perfectly if I'm swinging around me, where I'm gonna be letting go over there, sometimes letting go late over there. It's gonna be all over the place, yeah. but man, you get that right setup. Well, now your path, now your face are gonna be down the line of the target longer. It also improves your angle of attack. Ready? And I was able just to go down the line like this, and you can see those things just all go in the exact same direction. That's not possible consistently from this position right here. Well, the big thing that, that I think that I, why I always talk about, you know, toss your balls like that is because it's as simple as, well, you go back to earlier, you talk about the grip. The right palm represents the face of the golf club if you have a good grip. Well. If I'm like this, yeah, it's hard to meet this, right? My right palm is going to be in right field, and then a second later, a split second later, it's in left field. But if I go like this, if I let go of it a little bit early, my right palm is still basically facing where I want the ball to go, right, to the target. And if I go let go of it a little bit late, you know, I I have a great swing of Furic on a V1 that I use a lot and show people how 
he keeps a club face at the target. You know, it's on the target line forever. And there's just no twist in the face, right? So the more you're in a tilt and you're playing golf under, whether you're putting, right? Right, or you're hitting a drive, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I'm always trying to keep my chest down so my hands can work under my body, right, where I can stabilize the club face for the longest amount of time to bring in that shot pattern tighter. And how many people complain to us about early extension? Oh, I early extend. Oh, I early extend. I early extend. That isn't necessarily the flaw. It's an athletic response to what the flaw was well before that. Right. If you're not creating the fixed points in your setup to be able to swing underneath you and not around you to begin with, well, you're already in a position to come out of it. How about this one? How about when that next important part of the golf swing, the hand path, gets off? and it's too vertical or it's lifted up on behind our shoulders. Well, the only way I'm gonna shallow that club is late by standing up in the golf swing. So all those things that many think are the flaw, in fact, are not. And that's what I learned from Todd at a young age. Check the setup first. Then let's look at the takeaway. Then let's look at what you're doing to the top of the swing, which is why I've created the checkpoints I have of, hey, we have our setup. We have what happens below the belt, the set position. We have what happens to the top, simply turning everything up there without manipulating anything. And then you're locked and loaded in a position to where you don't have to make those adjustments now. At Porzak Golf, we take a lot of pride in having developed some of the best and most consistent golf swings on the planet. We do this through simplicity. Our Full Swing Masterclass will take you on a step-by-step, easy-to-understand process on how to get your golf swing better than ever. Join the many before you who've utilized our Full Swing Masterclass to take their games to the next level and beyond.